We're going to study two topics in this video, neural glia, or glial cells as they're called, and we'll look at the anatomy of a neuron. So here's a neuron and these supporting cells. These are the nuclei of the glial cells. So first we're going to look at the neural glia that's found in the central nervous system. The first type is the microglia. The microglia are these small, darker cells here. And what those do is they phagocytize or eat bacteria, and they also phagocytize and eat the cellular debris. So if one were to um, damage the neurons or have some damage to a neuron in the central nervous system, the microglia could eat up those damaged cells. Here's some other shots of the microglia over here. The next type of microglia found in the central nervous system is the oligodendrocyte. The oligodendrocytes are, are very important. They form the myelin sheath that surround the axons in the brain and spinal cord. So the oligodendrocytes are these cells here, the ones that have the, the clear or like the washed out cytoplasm. Here they are again with a different stain. They look different here. Here's a cartoon oligodendrocyte. So the orange one, that's the neuron, of course. And this blue cell, that's the oligodendrocyte. And you can see that the oligodendrocytes form the myelin sheath that surround the nerve. This myelin sheath is important, and we'll talk about it later. The next type of glial cell in the central nervous system is the astrocyte. The astrocyte does a lot of things. It supports blood vessels and neurons um, by providing the structural support, like physically holding it in place. It also regulates the nutrients and ion concentrations, forms scar tissue, and most notably, um, it, it's responsible for the formation of what's called the blood-brain barrier. That's a barrier, like a physical and chemical barrier that protects brain tissue from chemical fluctuations and prevents in entry of substances. Um, let's look at a cartoon of that. So here's an astrocyte, and it has these arm-like processes that are surrounding this capillary. So this would be part of the blood-brain barrier. Here's a little more sophisticated drawing, but I think it's worth our time to look at it. So what we're looking at here, this is the endothelium or the simple squamous epithelium of a capillary. So the simple squamous cells. And inside the capillary, we have red blood cells moving. And you know that while the red blood cells aren't escaping through the epithelium here, um, lots of Lots of molecules are permitted to flow in and out, but what the blood-brain barrier does is it restricts what's going to be flowing in and out. So this is the astrocyte here, and these are these little processes that are coming off the astrocyte. And look how the astrocyte covers the surface of this capillary. So what it does is it, is it provides a physical barrier, but it's also monitoring the chemicals and only allowing small things to come across that barrier, like glucose um, and ions and stuff like that. Larger molecules are not permitted to cross that blood-brain barrier. So when scientists develop um, pharmaceuticals, um, they have to be very aware that um, it may or may not cross through that blood-brain barrier. All right, the next type of glial cell that we're looking at is called an ependymal cell. The ependymal cell lines the central canal of the spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord, this thing. And then there's a little opening called the central canal. And in the central canal, it's hollow. Um, the only thing that you find in there is um, cerebral spinal fluid. And the ependymal cells are responsible for producing and regulating and sort of monitoring the conditions of that spinal fluid that, that's inside there. So here's a um, zoomed in shot. These are the ependymal cells. This is the central canal of the spinal cord, and in here you find that cerebral spinal fluid. You also find ependymal cells in the brain. They line the ventricle, so here's the ventricles of the brain. Um, here's an actual slide of the ventricle, so this space is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Here's brain tissue. These are ependymal cells here. It's the choroid plexus, which we'll talk about later, but these are also ependymal cells. And they monitor, again, the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so let's review the types of cells we learned about in the central nervous system. We have the ependymal cell, that's right here. That's um, secreting and monitoring the spinal fluid. We have these microglial cells. These are the little ones. 
Remember these phagocytized pathogens and cellular debris? We have the oligodendrocyte that's responsible for myelating the axons of the neurons. And then we have the cell called the astrocyte. That's the one that connects to the capillaries and also connects to neurons. It does a lot of things. But the important thing, or one of the important things that we discussed is it performs um, the functions of the blood-brain barrier. All right, now let's look at neuroglia of the peripheral nervous system. So we're shifting gears. We're no longer in the brain and spinal cord. Now we're out in the spinal nerves. There's only two types of cells. We have the Schwann cell. That's the most prevalent or most abundant cell in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the Schwann cell is just like the, well, not just like, but it's similar to the oligodendrocyte of the central nervous system in the sense that it's responsible for myelating the peripheral nerves. So did you catch that? In the central nervous system, the oligodendrocytes myelate the axons. In the peripheral nervous system, it's the Schwann cells that myelate, that myelinate um, the axons. So here's what it looks like histologically. These are the cell bodies of the neurons. And then here we have um, Schwann cells. These Schwann cells are wrapping around the nerve fibers. So this would be a nerve right here and a bunch of Schwann cells myelinating those axon fibers or those nerve fibers. Now here's an important clinical connection. Um, sometimes we learn about all these cell types and really the question is, oh my gosh, why do we need to know all these cell types? Well, all these cell types um, are important clinically as well. There's something called the schwannoma. The schwannoma is the most prevalent benign peripheral nerve tumor um, seen in humans. And it's derived from the myelin sheath or it's derived from that Schwann cell. So here we have a cartoon of one of these schwannomas wrapping itself um, around the tibial nerve here. So this is a person that's had their schwannoma removed. You can see it's four centimeters long. And I'm sure excising that was very precarious as it wraps itself around the nerve. So it can affect areas that are um, more sensitive or at least certainly more dangerous. For example, um, here's a schwannoma, also goes by the name acoustic neuroma, that's around the cochlear nerve right next to the brain stem. So you can see that if this schwannoma were to grow, and they do grow over time, it really has no space to grow. So if you're looking at it pushing up against um, things that are right next to your right next to your cranial vault and right next to your spinal cord. So these can be very dangerous, even though they're benign. So even though they're not cancerous, they can still be very dangerous. Here's either an MRI or a CT scan um, of some schwannomas. You can see right next to the brain stem. And our last type of cell is the satellite cell. This is the second type of glial cell that we see in the peripheral nerve system. The satellite cells sur surround the cell bodies of neurons. So this is a neuron cell body. And these are, the sh these are the satellite cells around them. So we're looking at the spinal cord here. And just off to the side, just lateral to the spinal cord, are these dorsal root ganglion. And in the dorsal root ganglion, that's where you find these cell bodies of the sensory neurons. That's a cell body. That's a cell body. Here's some more cell bodies over here. But then surrounding those cell bodies, those are the satellite cells. And they perform a similar function to the astrocyte in the sense that um, they sort of maintain the chemical environment um, around these cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Now let's look at the anatomy of a neuron. We've already studied this. Um, let's just look at it a little more in depth. Remember, these are the dendrites. We want to know that these dendrites conduct impulses or action potentials in one direction towards the cell body. And these dendrites provide a receptive surface so that axons of other neurons can synapse with it. So this is the direction of impulse down the axon. So this is the axon here, and you can see that's a myelated, a myelinated axon. So we already know about the axon, but that conducts nerve impulses away from the cell body towards the terminal axon. And now this terminal axon can now communicate with a dendrite or another cell body. The node of Rainier, this is important. This is the node of Rainier right here. Uh, what that is, is that's a gap in the myelin sheath and that facilitates the rapid 
impulse conduction. So we'll learn about the depolarization of this axon, which is actually the impulse itself or the action potential. But notice how I was kind of skipping my, my cursor along. The action potential doesn't actually flow through all of the axon. It jumps in sort of a jumpy or saltatory fashion. And we just have depolarization at these nodes of Rainier. And consequently, um, some of these large neurons, they can actually transmit an impulse at 120 meters per second. So that's over the length of a football field in one second. Here's a close-up view of the myelination. So this would be a Schwann cell in the peripheral nervous system. And the Schwann cell wraps around the axon. And this is like this, um, the phospholipid membrane or the phospholipid plasma membrane um, of, the, of the Schwann cell. And then this area up here, that's like the cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. But this, this folding of the cytoplasm, that's what forms the myelin sheath. And lastly, let's look at how these communicate with each other. So this is an axon, and the direction of travel is this way. And you can see this axon is going to synapse with this dendrite. So here we have, this is the axon that's coming into the synapse, and this is the dendrite on the other side of the synapse. We call this the presynaptic um, neuron, and this is the postsynaptic neuron. So that's what we see here. This is the presynaptic neuron. Here's the synapse, travels towards the cell body, and then travels away from the cell body on the process called the axon. So if we we're gonna diagram this, we would see the cell body transmitting an impulse through the axon. Then at the synapse, we have the axon of the presynaptic neuron releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters that communicates with the postsynaptic neuron cell body and then that is transmitted along the axon of the postsynaptic neuron. And then lastly, let's look at the distinction between white matter and gray matter. We've talked about myelinated axons versus um, parts of the neuron that aren't myelinated. That's all that white matter and gray matter are. So white matter are regions of the central nervous system that have an abundance of myelinated axons. Gray matter are simply regions in the central nervous system that don't contain myelin. So that would be like the neuron cell bodies and the unmyelinated axons and the dendrites. So here on the brain, on the surface, superficially, we have the gray matter, and then deep to that, you see the white matter. So this would be um, unmyelinated. This would be myelinated. Same thing is, is visible in um, this, this radiograph or this MRI, whatever it is. Here we have the gray matter, and then deep to that, we have the white matter. And you can see that on um, a real brain as well. You, you notice the difference in coloration that we have superficially here versus the, the whiter um, coloration we see down here. So unmyelinated, myelinated. And the same thing is true in the spinal cord. This area here that looks like a butterfly, that's gray matter. So here's gray matter again. And then the region outside of that, um, that would be unmyelinated. 